Hello and welcome to Tuesday Newsday, your number one resource for the entire week's worth of VR news. Hopefully you all had a spooky Halloween weekend, but if you didn't, then this week's news might leave you with a little fright. But between some questionable statements from Sony regarding VR and their very own PlayStation VR, and some more information on the deck of gear in Catwalk C, we've got a lot to cover. So let's just get right into the news. First off, something pretty hilarious. Recently, some internal documents from the studio Crytek have been leaked to the public that outline the company's future plans for upcoming games. In case you don't know, Crytek is the studio behind classics like Crisis, known better for the past decade as being the benchmark of choice for everything from graphics cards to toasters. The but can it run Crisis meme seems to never die. And although the recent launch of the remaster of Crisis hasn't gone over so well, within these leaked documents were plans for a Crisis Battle Royale and Crysis Crisis VR. Now there are a few flat screen games that I play and immediately feel like the game would just be better in VR, and maybe that's my bias showing, but Crisis is definitely one of them. Between the physics interactions and sneaking, I think that the game would just be perfect for the VR power trip. But according to Game Rant, it may be a little further off than we think if it ever comes. Here's what the article says, quote, The documents also mention Crisis VR, though the demo supposedly made the developers testing the game violently sick, end quote. <laughs> I don't know, imagining these developers all testing this experimental VR version of Crisis, probably playing at like 12 FPS and quickly getting violently ill, just sounds a little morbidly hilarious to me. And we all know there are certainly ways to not make people motion sick in VR games, and hopefully the Crytek team has learned those methods from other VR games and VR developers, because I personally would love to see a Crisis in VR, honestly. I should also say this, that that this was a leak and has not been officially confirmed or anything, but it's still pretty interesting. But now on to the spooky. Imagine if you could be identified with near perfect accuracy by just using a VR headset, not by logging into an account or providing retinal information, but by just moving naturally within VR. Well, that's a thing already, and it's shockingly accurate. Researchers at Stanford recently conducted a study using plain old HTC Vives, a pool of 511 users and five minutes of usage each, and the system was able to identify who was who with 95% accuracy. Now, this isn't using eye tracking or fingerprints or retinal scanning. This is just plain tracking information from the headset and controllers. I know that I have talked about the scary possibilities in the future regarding eye tracking and our biometric data being in the wrong hands before, but I was honestly pretty shocked at how much our simple movements in the metrics tracked by current headsets reveal about our identities. It's it's almost like a movement fingerprint. Now, this may sound pretty trivial, but the point of the Stanford experiment was not necessarily to test out some new machine learning algorithm on identifying people through VR tracking points, but instead, it was to make a point about how we should all be careful and very aware as to who's tracking what and make rules about what can be done with that data. This is what the research paper itself says. Quote, in both the privacy policy of Oculus and HTC, makers of the two most popular VR headsets in 2020, the companies are permitted to share any de-identified data. If the tracking data is shared according to rules for de-identified data, then regardless of what is promised in principle, in practice, taking one names off of a data set accomplishes very little. End quote. And the article finishes with a chilling recommendation for everyone involved. With the rise of virtual reality, body tracking data has never been more accurate and more plentiful. There are many good uses of this tracking data, but it can also be abused. This work suggests that tracking data during an everyday VR experience is an effective identifier even in larger samples. We encourage the research community to explore methods to protect VR tracking data." End quote. So basically, this research paper calls for better privacy practices industry-wide before it's too late. Pretty much, it doesn't matter if your data is de-identified. Road to VR says it perfectly in their article on the subject. Quote, companies could harvest that de-identified biometric data, not only to figure out who you are, but to predict your habits, understand your vulnerabilities, and create marketing profiles intent on grabbing your attention with a new level of granularity. End quote. Now, this isn't to scare anyone, and I fully understand the tug and pull between fighting for good privacy policies and submitting to the inevitability that you have no privacy and both sides just want good, cheap devices that work well. However, 
especially when venturing into the relatively unexplored territory of virtual reality and the data that we all have from it. Even though we love VR, it's good to be aware of who knows what and what's being done with that data. But enough with being hyper serious. If you've been following the situation on PlayStation 5 and PSVR and its relationship with the PlayStation 4, the whole thing is extremely weird and off-putting. Sony did promise backwards compatibility and VR support for the PS5, but it's all just a scattered mess and it has me feeling pretty terrible for any PSVR users out there. Starting off with the PSVR's tracking methods. The headset uses the PlayStation camera. Well, a newer version of that camera that is better in every single way has been released for the PS5, yet it's not compatible with PSVR, so you have to use your old camera and also use an adapter that you have to order from Sony directly, but then onto the games. If you want to use VR, then you'll have to downgrade your game or rebuy the game for the PS4 version, so you'll lose out on any improvements in-game that take advantage of the PS5's hardware. For example, if you buy Hitman 3 on PlayStation 5 to play with PlayStation VR, then you'll actually have to buy the PlayStation 4 version of the game, otherwise no VR. <laughs> then the odd situation of controllers. Once again, if you want to play a PSVR game that utilizes the PlayStation controller on the PlayStation 5, you'll have to use a PlayStation 4 controller. Basically, the PSVR is completely caught in limbo, in between generations and in between receiving support and not receiving support. And given what this PlayStation executive had to say really recently regarding VR, it's kind of starting to make more sense. Quote, I think we're more than a few minutes from the future of VR. PlayStation believes in VR, Sony believes in VR, and we believe that at some point in the future, VR will represent a meaningful component of interactive entertainment. Will it be this year? No. Will it be next year? No. But it will be at some stage. We believe that." End quote. Honestly, some interesting words. In my opinion, VR represents a meaningful component of interactive entertainment now, but apparently Sony doesn't believe that. I have often thought pretty highly of Sony, even though the PSVR isn't great in any way. It still was pretty darn successful and pushed millions to get into VR for the first time, but it does seem that Sony is taking a backseat and focusing on the PS5 launch at the moment. And while I of course don't believe with that action, and I wish that Sony would still be present in the VR industry and support the PSVR and maybe make a PSVR 2 sooner than later, but it seems that they're willing to let others car about the industry for them. Also, a quick word on the state of the Elite and Elite battery straps from Oculus and the Oculus Quest 2. It's been widely reported that the Elite strap breaks easily and suffers from some pretty terrible quality control. The straps have also been completely paused in terms of shipment entirely from Oculus as they're looking into what's causing the issue. Right now, I have an Elite battery strap and I haven't had any issues with it, but that doesn't mean that others haven't. <laughs> and I am likely going to ruin it doing a stress test video just to see what the issue is, or if it's even an issue. But the facts are facts. Tons of people are reporting the strap breaking at the moment, and I just want to see why or how. But as of now, it's an issue, and I don't think that you could buy an elite strap. But now, it's time for a meme break! You know, Amazon and other online store algorithms are pretty good at making you spend money. The frequently purchased together section always gets me to be honest. But you know, sometimes it could really come in clutch. Like the frequently bought together section for the Oculus Quest 2 Elite Strap. The best accessory for your Elite Strap is duct tape. Actually, now, uh, Elite Tape. But now, back to the news. So there has been more information dropped on the Deca Gear and its peripherals. And in case you need a quick rundown, the Deca Gear is a new VR headset that's set to launch next year that offers some really impressive specs like 2160 by 2160 resolution per eye and facial tracking all for $450. One of the cool things that I'm excited about regarding the headset and the whole package is the Deca Move, a hip tracker that comes with the headset that is said to revolutionize the way that we move within VR. Using your hip more naturally to turn versus your controllers or headset itself. But I definitely was worried about the support for this though, since if Deca Gear is the only headset that supports the hip-based tracking, then there's not much incentive for developers to go back and add support unless the Deca becomes massively popular. Well, turns out that the Deca Move is going to be compatible with just about all VR headsets, Quest, Index, G2, you name it. And the company openly said that they'll send one out to any developers that wants it. Interesting strategy to get more people on board with something that seems to be better 
better than what we have now. By the way, just an update in case you haven't watched the streams or been in my Discord, I am still doing the interview with Decagear and that's going to be on my Twitch channel on Thursday at 7 a.m. EST. I was planning on holding it last week, but there was a scheduling conflict, so it's still happening. It was just delayed by a week. And one more bit of news regarding the omnidirectional treadmill from CatVR. They are finally shipping. The first round of devices are out the door, and I had originally covered the Kickstarter a few months ago, and I've been massively excited for the project, and it's about time they start arriving. Definitely looking forward to the video that's going to come from that piece of hardware. And now it's time for question of the week from <laughs> XQC. What VR headset got me interested in VR, and what got me motivated to make content on VR news? Well, my first headset that I owned shortly was an Oculus Rift DK2, or Development Kit 2. I owned it for a few months before selling it to buy an Oculus Rift around launch time, and while the DK2 was my first headset, the Rift CV1 was the headset that really gave me a love for VR. And I guess I've always watched a lot of YouTube, and I like making videos about things I love as well, so it was a natural fit. I do try and do a lot more content on my channel than just Tuesday Newsday, but the only video I really know I'm going to do every week is usually Tuesday Newsday. Until I make some other weekly content that I could make every week, it's probably going to stay that way. And that's question of the week. Leave your own below in the comment section and I may just answer yours next. I will be streaming today, so stop on by and say what's up. I'd love to see you there. Also, come into my Discord server. I will be hosting a meetup this Friday within VR Chat, open to anybody, and the best way to get there is is through my Discord server, so come on in. I want to say thank you to all of my Patreon supporters, especially my Omegas like Very Evil Shadow, Fusion Oak, Ronzarelli, Benji, True Killa, That Brock Guy, KR, Dented Melon, Chaotic, CBCJ79, and HCG Random. I couldn't do any of this without you. Don't forget to like this video if you loved it, subscribe if you want more of this, and hit that freaking bell if you just can't live without it. Much love, Thrill Out.